Hello, everyone, and welcome to the long and winding Royal Road. This is episode 31, uh, the first of 2023. And um, I got a really special treat for everyone because, especially for myself, because when I do shows, whenever I create a show, like say Cruel Summer or Thunderstruck and, and this show, I always think there's a bucket list or or a short list of, of on the bucket list of guests that I, I always want to talk to about a specific topic. And and always on that list is our guest today. I'm so excited to be talking to him. And that's my good friend from the Pro Wrestling Torch, the, the host of the Pro Res Paradise. And that's Alan Forel. Hello, Alan. Hello, WH. And I bet when you were... Uh... I bet when you were thinking that through and when you were when you were thinking about uh, Alan Forel's on the bucket list for the long and winding Royal Road, the history of the great All Japan matches in the 90s, I can't wait to talk to him about a Jun Izumida match. I mean, it, it wasn't my first choice. I did send you a suggestion, but just so you know, some behind the scenes is like I said, you, let's talk about the the Can Ams versus Kikuchi and Kugabashi for the All Asia Tags, and and you were like, I have talked about that match so many times that you wanted to do something different. Every, everyone has heard my story about meeting Kobashi and talking about the match with J- Jamesy, who I didn't even know at the time was behind me in the queue at the meet and greet and uh, swears it was the greatest thing he had ever seen in his life. And uh, yeah, uh, Kobashi uh, staring longingly at the photo. I, I had printed off uh, my computer the screenshot of VLC player that I got him to sign of the finish of the match. Everyone's heard me tell that story everyone has has uh heard me talk about that match they've heard me talk about uh dan crawford's a uh, heelish strut everything about that match it's all out there it's obviously a classic and i want to leave the door open to a, a fresh voice to pick that match and talk about it somewhere else down the long and winding royal road we've got important june is a business to get to that's that it's 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 probably the only time we'll ever talk about Jun Izumita on this show. Um, I don't know. We, I, I was gonna mainly go delve into the background of like Hayabusa and Jinsei Suzaki a, a, a bit more, even though I I, I do recommend I, I do go into depth about Hayabusa in particular, his involvement in in old Japan in this era on the episode one with uh, Scrump from Pro Wrestling Tees, where we talked about uh, Hayabusa and Suzaki versus Misawa. And Akiyama from uh, '97, but yep. uh, if you want to, if you want more background, I'm gonna go. I, I would recommend people go listen to that if you haven't heard it already. But I'll talk a little bit about that. But like, but before we get to Jun Izumita, Alan, we, we should explain that. Um, so just so you people know, Alan uh, doesn't like to be on camera, which is perfectly fine. We only need his dulcet tones. Well, it, it, it does depend. It depends on, depends on the day. <laughs> the other day so alan's feeling a little uh camera shy today so which is fine i we just need his voice and so he has this uh, incredibly uh interesting photograph of uh kind of himself with one keiji mudo here How, maybe we can delve into this picture first before we continue alan oh it's it's, it's me hanging out shirtless with my my good pal my close personal friend uh keiji mudo the Pro wrestling genius who I love and respect and, and hope his career goes on forever and he should he should get all the titles. Um and uh I, I'm I'm not rushing at all for him to feck off and just uh mm. retire and stop annoying everyone with his egotistical BS uh yeah and refusal to put over any young talent whatsoever. Um no, this was us uh this was us on a, a fine day at Wrestle One in Cork and all hanging out together backstage. Um, actually, it wasn't backstage. It was in the corridor, and it, they had up one of these uh, little uh, carnival deals where you put your head through, and uh, um, yeah. So this is my head going through the uh, shirtless person in front of KG Mudo, and of course, the shirtless wrestler in front of KG Mudo was made smaller than KG Mudo in uh, by about a good three feet. So the the Mudo ego at play yet again here. What's hilarious is that you're probably just as tall as Keiji Mudo in real life. I think he's got a couple inches on me. I'm six on the nose, and I think he's like six two, isn't he? Um, uh, sure. 
Uh, he shrunk. He has shrunk over the years. Now we'll we'll say well, that. Well, but... having no knees will will do that to a human being. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, can I just say I, I'm pretty sure I've talked about I've said this before to you, but like when we met in real life, I was so surprised at how actually tall you are, because that was not my image of you at all. I see. I don't even think I'm that tall. Like it's uh, well compared yeah, it's, to me. Like I'm five six uh, thereabouts, and yeah, you're. I, I was like, whoa, Alan's huge. <laughs> well, there was who, who else would you? There was a few tall people on that first. Uh, time I went to Japan, that first trip, there was Matt McEwen. Matt McEwen's pretty tall. He's pretty tall. John is pretty tall. Um, who else was there? But I didn't Joe. know. I I wasn't aware of who they were, Alan. I was aware of who you were. You know. Yeah, so that's I true. Like, you have like this, you know, image of somebody maybe based on how they talk or I've or got short thing. guy energy. Short uh, king no, energy. No, no, I just I just didn't expect you to be like oh, like tall <laughs> i don't know maybe oh, i just assume everyone's i, I like i like height. the idea i like the idea of me having short king energy that's uh some of my favorite people in the world shout out to iron mike spears he's got serious short king energy as he's as he is the first to to say um but uh yeah i uh i don't know um i've got i've got ridiculously like long limbs like my arms are really long I, that doesn't contribute to my height but uh and yeah just yeah, kind of gangly. Uh, hard, hard to put on weight. No, oh, that's fine. I mean, I mean, your your long limbs are definitely contribute to you uh, pumping your fist in the air when you're at live shows. And it, it's great for helping elderly women reach things in the supermarket that they. Uh, I get asked that a lot, and uh, yeah, always, always, always feel pretty damn great about myself after doing that. I must say, <laughs> you sure, I'll, I'll, I'll get those. Uh, I'll, I'll get those dishwasher tablets from the top shelf for you, ma'am. Here you go. Strut away with a smile on my face. Well, you know who I was who I was talking to about uh, recording with you, and and who is also fairly tall himself is, is one John Pollock. And I said, John, when it, when is the uh, much anticipated, you know, John Pollock, Alan Farrell audio show coming out? And and so you you and John have to make an arrangement to to record something together. Yeah, I've, I've tried. I've, I've sent John a message or two, but he is a he's he's a busy man. Like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bug him on the WH. If you want to bug him on it, that's that's all. Yeah, you could you can do it. But I I know how busy he is, so I uh, um yeah I I don't want to press too hard there. No, of course not. But I, I I will say that he he is very much wanting to do a show with with you, Alan. And and uh, when when it does happen, I think it's more a question of when, not if. Then, then I'm I'm going to be the first person to in in the queue to to download that onto my uh, podcasting app. Yeah, the the um, I, I think the the time we do come together and do audio will be uh, will be some audio gold for sure. Whether it's pro wrestling paradise, whether it's post wrestling produce, or whether it's some kind of a simulcast, uh, whatever way we do it, I think it would be uh, no doubt a lot of fun. I, I'm sure it will be so. Let, let's talk about today's match, Alan. Uh, you, you, this is your pick. We are going to talk about a match from the year of 1999. It's uh, uh, the, the start of 1999, January 16th. It's emanating from one of your favorite places to watch wrestling and mine, uh, Cork and Hall. Uh, January 16th, 1999. It's the tag team of uh, FMW's Hayabusa and Michinoku Pro's Jin Shinzaki taking on the All Japan team of Jun Izumita and Taman Honda, who are at the time the All Asia Tag Champions, and and we kind of like you know hinted at this about Jun Izumita, like not someone you would normally, uh, he, not not a name you would normally hear on this show because he he's not really known for having like bangers in All Japan at the time or or even in Noah. Um, I do make a point in in my notes of saying like you know both him and Honda were kind of like you know your perennial mid card dudes. Honda had a bit more success as he would eventually become Kenta Kobashi's tag team partner in pro wrestling Noah. And they would win the world tag team titles there. But uh, at this time, he's still kind of like, you know, lower on the card. Izumita would, would be a perennial undercard guy because he like, to be frank, he was never really that good of a wrestler. 
Oh, and now you'll get some, you'll get some pushback on that W page. You'll get it somewhat strongly from me, but there's there's other people online who you'll get it very strongly from. T- Timon Honda was a a big favorite uh, amongst um, Japanese wrestling fans in the I would say in the two thousands. Um, you know, a uh, funny story about Timon Honda. Um, uh, someone who is a famous person outside of wrestling who it's it's very much been talked about uh and is well known i think at this stage um that they are a big wrestling fan and have connections to wrestling that being lars Fredrickson. um he has appeared on wrestling podcasts he has been in the front row of like AEW shows and stuff uh, very open with his friendship with uh, CM Punk and now uh, Ruby Soho, who he uh, gave the the music for, for AEW. So a lot of people know about Lars's uh, connections to wrestling, but what they don't know is Lars Fredrickson, huge Timon Honda fan, to the point that he had a little side project band, um, which was called The Timones. I did not know that. You know, yeah. that's yeah. why we have Alan on the show for his for... Timon Honda based Ramones well, band, side project. Band. I, I mean, I'm talking more about Izumita as being, you know, not very good. I, I, oh, I've never, yeah, oh, yeah, Izumita is terrible. <laughs> I mean, uh, Honda is a very solid, you know, amateur background, gr- really good, solid technician in the ring, and and good as I think I, I enjoyed his tag team with Kobashi. I thought it was a really nice, uh, an odd, odd couple kind of a tag team and, and their I think title match against each other during kobashi's reign yeah. one of yeah one of the yeah sorry i was confused there i thought yeah uh, you'd, you'd get pushed back on not liking honda if that was the case but obviously that's not the case but if you uh if you weren't uh so favorable to june is i don't think there's been many big june is defenders out there maybe uh, maybe, uh, maybe billy corrigan's a, a super closeted uh june is fan that we don't know about I, I feel like Dr. Keith might have uh, he might have been a fan of, of the the Izu back in the PPH days I think but that could have been partially to troll um, the likes of uh, Mike Sempervivi and Zach Arnold back in those days uh, I, I I'd say Dr. Keith would enjoy the wackiness all caps till the bang of uh, one Izu uh, did you ever see Izumita with his uh, Kamala cosplay when he team with that uh, Kamala too Yeah with so in for people who don't know, like if you ever go watch Giant Kimala 2 in All Japan for Wrestling, uh, a favorite of Giant Baba's at the time as, a, as someone to book on the undercard, like at some point, I, I do think it's probably like uh, to punish something is me to dead in, you know, backstage that, that Baba said, you know what? You're going to team with Giant Kimala 2. You're going to wear his fucking gimmick. You're going to, you're going to play <laughs> like, you know, like a, 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 a tribal person from, from 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 whatever part of Africa that that Jay Kamala too is from, and and oh, or Uganda, he's from Uganda, I would imagine. Well, hey, like, Jay Kamala too, he's from Botswana because he was the Botswana beast in well, world class, world class, and him and Terry Gordy had, I think, one of the most violent wrestling matches I've ever seen in my life on an episode of World Class t- t- TV in the late eighties, um, where the story of the match and the story that was. Um, being put across by the commentators under no uncertain terms they weren't they weren't being subtle about this whatsoever this was the very clear story of the match was the Botswana beast is a cannibal and he is trying to eat Terry Gordy and Terry Gordy with the pride of the USA in his heart will not stand for that of course not 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 also like Terry Gordy is from Tennessee right so uh is he from? He's no. He's, he's, he's from Bad Street. He's from Bad Street. I think he's originally from Tennessee, though. And then he hooked up with Michael Hayes and just wow. moved to Bad Street, USA, in, in yeah. Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. But but yeah, Terry Gordy. <laughs> I don't know. The thought of someone being able to eat Terry Gordy doesn't seem too plausible. I That's don't care a full how meal. He's a, he's a big boy. He's a tough man too. So yeah. you know. you'd you'd earn your you'd earn your dinner if Terry Gordy was your dinner. Like that's. You had to put yourself to work. You, you burnt those calories before you got to eat that meal. But yeah, the the I, the greatest thing is Mita was ever a part of. I will say though, to give him credit, was um, are you familiar with the Pro Wrestling Noah Christmas Carols? Uh, Wh? Yes, I am. So um, these were annual specials they would put out on uh, 
I think NTV um, probably uh, during the 2000s um, where they'd have Misawa, Santa Claus and a green outfit and all this kind of stuff. They do all these wacky skits and everything. But my absolute favorite skit was from, I think it was the 2005 um, one. And they are basically telling this story where uh, they're at the show and uh, it's, it's going back and forth between the lives of Kenta and Marafuji as they both prepare for a uh, hot night out on the town at Christmas, a Christmas date with a lovely young lady. They each have s- similar kind of evenings planned going on. The two the two young baby faces that Masao was pushing in Noah. Um, but they were both on second duty uh, that night at the show. And you have Masao, of course, being seconded by Mara Fuji. And... Uh, Izumita being seconded by um, Kenta, and uh, which seems unrealistic in 2005, but go with go with this flow anyway. Um, Misawa uh, sees Mara Fuji looking up at the clock, and he's like, "You can tell from body language. I, I don't speak Japanese, but it's very clear what's going on here." Um, he's like, "Hey, where where are you where are you rushing to? You what's what's going on?" And Marafuji obviously explains to Misawa, hey boss, look, I got this date, this young, pretty girl, I'm looking to show her a nice night out in the town. And Misawa's like, ah, oh, shucks, I remember when I was young. You you don't worry about me. You don't need to wash my back. You can you can go out and you can hit the town. Go on, kid. And Marafuji's like, thank you, thank you. And he goes off and show him running away. And it shows him meeting up with this girl and like George Michael last Christmas starts playing. And it's it shows the trees and the lights and it's really happy. And and then it cuts back to Kenta and he's in the locker room and he's scrubbing Izumita's back and Izumita's reading the paper and and then he hands Kenta this jar of like chocolate spread or something. He's like, hey, open this for me. And um pulls out some big thick slice of white bread and and Kenta's trying to open the jar and he can't open he keeps looking up at the clock and Izumita's like totally no selling it doesn't doesn't get the get the gist whatsoever it's absolutely tremendous and uh, eventually Kenta gets that jar open he legs it out of there gets to his date meeting place arrives there's no girl and he's dejected, the head is down. But then he gets a tap on the shoulder. And he perks up and he's like, ah! Oh! And he turns around. And it's Izumita in his gear, out in the street, holding the jar, asking him to open it again. And then it cuts into Mariah Carey, All I Want for Christmas. And it shows Kenta and Izumita dancing and popping champagne out in the street. It's the best thing ever. <laughs> yes, probably the, the, the good times for for Izumita. And unfortunately, um, he, is, he is the the person who wrote the book, as I recall, correct me if I'm wrong here, Alan, he wrote the book that revealed the, the supposed Yakuza ties to Pro Signola that, that nearly destroyed this company. Yeah, I think you're right. Actually, I for, totally forgot about that. And uh, he passed away shortly yeah. after that, didn't he? A couple he did. Of years. Yeah. It's really dark times. Like not, not, not just for Noah, but for, for Ginny Zavita as well. It's, and I think it, it's kind of sad. Like, and, you know, like we, we kind of make fun. Like he was never going to be, he was never a really great wrestler. This is probably the, this period we're going to talk about this match is probably one of the peaks of his career. Um, but like that, he'll probably be known among like a lot of hardcore, you know, you know, all Japan and, and, and Noah fans, for, particularly Noah fans of being the guy who nearly destroyed the company because of his book. Because I don't think he was, he was looked too fondly upon after that book came out. And like, people just like read like, Oh sh- shit Noah's allegedly got all these ties to the yakuza of selling tickets and and things like that so i imagine he any friends he might have had in the locker room totally gone after that yeah i think he might have been i could be wrong but was he maybe one of the guys who was gone already at the stage he did that where like there was the the older guys that got cut and that led to being what like the burning guys left Kobashi yeah. leaving because they were like, okay, if Misawa was still here, the old guys would be taken care of. And this was going against the uh, not taking care of the older guys and having them have jobs for life is kind of going against the ethos of kind of what this promotion was built on and, and stuff. But uh, yeah. Um, uh, 
yeah, as you said, pretty dark time those last couple of years uh, for all Izzy. Well, we'll we'll try to focus on the positive. We're going to talk about uh, a match I I don't ever recall seeing, so I'm going to assume I'm just going to say this is my first time watching this match, and and I'm I'm quite at the end of it. I I will say I was quite glad that you picked this because I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was such a a really fun match, and we'll get into the details of it. Um, I do want to just briefly touch upon Hayabusa. Like I I always say, you know. Like if Baba was able to like you know steal him away from FMW full time, like would have been terrible for FMW. Would have been terrible. I think they would have survived to some extent with Masato Tanaka and 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 Mike Awesome still there. But I I do think if if Baba was able to like coerce and 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 stage a coup with the talents of Hayabusa, it would have been such a great boon to all Japan in the late nineties. Yeah, like um, on Awesome, Awesome would have been pretty much regular ECW by 99 and then WCW, so he would have been off the table as well. Um, FMW was just going down a path anyway that I don't think, like, Ayabusa maybe kind of kept them afloat to an extent, but it's not like, it's not like, yeah, they were going in one direction. It was just kind of, preventing the inevitable really i think when you talk about fmw and the issues they had and masao was i guess really good friends with hayabusa and baba wanted them so like at this point in time in the 90s to have baba and masao both kind of leaning in the same direction on something was probably rare in in all japan so um i think hayabusa would have been a guy they would have really loved to get I, I, one of the reasons I, I picked this match was I, I think it's interesting to look at 1999 Hayabusa because uh, when he first came into All Japan in 97, and, and he, the, the match you talked about with Masawa Nakayama, but also from that tag league, the Kawada Taue matches is one of my favorite All Japan matches. Um, I probably would have picked that if you hadn't already done the Akiyama Masawa match from the same real world tag league. Um, but I thought it was interesting to, to look at a match from two years later because you can kind of see how Hayabusa has gotten so much more polished as a worker by this point, I think, compared to uh, not even so much compared to 97, but really, like, if you look back to mid, like, 94, 95, Hayabusa, like, he is so rough around the edges. And at this point in 99, he's just so much more polished and... Um, I think him and, and Shinzaki had a really solid tag team act down at this point with the double teams. And yeah, just the, the chemistry they had together was was really strong and they were really over. And yeah, I think anything from this era of all Japan, 99 in particular, is interesting to look at because they were fielding so much criticism uh, for being kind of, the same guys and the same matches and um no real huge advancement of of, of things and uh, people didn't like how kind of how long Kawada had to wait and when he did finally beat Misawa it was the the weird um uh the triangle way? situation that yeah. they had yeah in, in the 97 champion carnival so like there was a lot of there was a lot of criticism um, of all Japan and people wanted fresh stuff there and and I feel like Baba and all Japan don't get the credit because when I go back I wasn't following at the time but when I went back and, and was watching all this stuff in order all through the 90s like I really enjoyed the 97 to 99 stuff because they were getting these new guys in here that were to me as watching it a decade or so later I did feel the kind of freshness. Um, so I don't know why that wasn't acknowledged more in the time because you had guys like the UWFI guys, Kakihara, Young Takayama, um, first starting to get good. Gary Albright, I think, was awesome in, in all Japan. Um, Daisuke Ikeda came over. And then the FMW guys, when they were able to use them, they, they did. So I, they probably could have done more on the foreign side i think they probably could have got more um, fresh american guys in at that point they were still kind of going with the 
to try to trusted your Johnny Aces, your Steve Williams after with these guys already kind of having been past it at this point. So I think they could have made an effort to get some more interesting American names or, or European names. But um, yeah, it's it's an interesting period of All Japan. And then Vader comes in, and I think Vader in All Japan is a tremendous run. So yeah, I, I like this era, and this is like a, a real... Like, I wanted to pick a match that would... That there was a good chance a lot of people listening to this hadn't seen before or weren't aware of. And no, it's not going to be like a Masao Kawada Kabashi level classic, but it's a really fun match that complements that stuff and shows where there was some freshness on All Japan. And uh, this is also the era where you're getting to see more of the undercard stuff because Samurai TV is up and running at this point. So you're not just relying on the uh, commercial tapes and the weekly uh, television, which is is, is very much going to just be focused on the main events because like 1990 through to 96, you don't, there's not a lot of All Japan undercard stuff that isn't just a two minute joined in progress clipped version, you know? So um, getting to see a full match from an undercard with guys like this in it was, was pretty cool. And, it's, and we're fortunate that they, you know, this is the the era of Samurai TV that we are getting this stuff, as you said. Uh, I will I will also say, like, on the native side of, of this era of All Japan, you had the, like, the eventual, like, the, the rise of Jun Akiyama. He was just leaping and bounding to to the top of the card. He was eventually break off with Kobashi, form his own group. Manakea Moss, man, Takao Mori. The, the future was bright. Like, if, if the split didn't happen, like, and, and Misawa got full control, I think what you saw in Noah mixed in with what was already existing in, in Noah in, in on all Japan, sorry, in all Japan, sorry, would be would have been like, you know, it's one of those what is, but I, I like to think that it would have been really, really good stuff. And I think the juniors would have like finally have taken off in that company. But such as it was, we did get a great company in personally Noah, regardless. So it's, it's know, good. I would have liked to have seen how Morishima developed under the guide of Baba rather than um Misawa and Noah. Uh I think, yeah, I think Baba probably would have been a good, a good kind of, uh, Morishima probably needed some, uh, you know. Strict your Baba, father? Yeah, Baba, Baba knew how to treat different wrestlers with different types of personalities. And I think Morishima probably needed an arm around the shoulder kind of a thing, like that boost in confidence. And I, I, I feel like Baba maybe would have been more prone to do that than Misawa. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on that. Like the Noah, uh, everything you hear about the Noah Dojo and the, the Noah system in the 2000s, like it's outside of Kobashi, everyone loves Kobashi, but outside of him, like it sounds like it was pretty tough, unforgiving kind of um, situation. So you, like, you got a lot of hard asses coming through there, like your Sugiras and your Kentas and your Tsuchiokis, like, Two of those three men came from the army, so you, you've got that real drill sergeant kind of thing going on. Whereas I think, I think Baba might have been a bit more, you know, he, he might have known when the soft skills were needed a bit more. And I think mm -hmm. Morishima is someone that probably would have benefited from that. You know what? I, I can't argue with any of that. Um, again, Morishima is one of those people that you just look at what happened in his career and his life and... It's it's a it's a really sad thing, and who knows what would have happened if like he maybe had a better, not a better, I don't know. Who knows what kind of mentor Masao really was to to any of these guys? A lot of people love him, you know, Marafuji, and, and and such love 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 Masawa and stuff like that. So who knows? Uh, but let, let's talk about the card for, before we get to the match. Uh, this is from like I said the uh, January sixteenth, nineteen ninety nine Cork and Hall show. It's part of the All Japan uh, New Year Giant Series. It's day 12 of that tour, and they're in Cork and Hall, like I said. And uh, it's a full Cork and Hall, Alan. It's 2,100 people in attendance here. And I, I don't think that's a work. I think that's a legit number there. Yeah, it, it was jam-packed. And I, I thought it was interesting the way they shot it. Um, I couldn't tell. Maybe you might know better than me, WH. But it looked like the, cam, the hard cam was either in one of the balconies or in a different position in the orange seats um, because... It just was looking down at the ring kind of from a different angle. The only other match I can think of that comes to mind that I remember being filmed in this way in Corican was the uh, 
a match I gave five stars to the June 25th, I want to say, 2000 uh, tag match in New Japan, which was um, uh, Otani and Takaiwa versus uh, the junior stars, um, Kanemoto and Minoru Tanaka. That was filmed in the same way. I think it was a camera on the balcony um, they had shooting down, um, which makes sense if it was a packed cork and they probably were able to remove the hard cam setup from the orange seats and free up some seats there. So that's very possible. I mean, they, they would have like just gone to the back of where the, the orange seat section is, I think, like instead of like sometimes they have it, as I recall, maybe, maybe in the middle, right? In the middle section yeah of the of the where the orange seats are in cork and hall i think if they're looking down then it's it's either probably two hard cams one in the balcony and one the other hard cam would be like from the um from the orange seats at the top section which which they do have room up there for for that so no it, it i i never i didn't really notice it myself but I, I you know like i think depending on the setup that they have for Cork and Hall, like how many people are there, how many tickets they sell in advance that they probably do change the, the layout and, and the, and like the setup of where their cameras are, are going to be. So, you know, I mean, if you watch enough shows from Cork and Hall, I feel myself, like I, it just blends in. Like you can notice differences between certain promotions and how they do their camera setups and stuff like that. But from one promotion show to show, it's, it's not always necessarily evident to me. So that's, it's a great observation you made there. Uh, let, let's talk about this card though. Uh, let's, let's we'll go through the results for uh, opening things up is a singles match between uh, I know two, two, two of your favorites for sure, Alan Makoto Hashi and now my now Michi Marafuji. They went to a 15 minute time limit draw, yeah, very early in the career of, of both these guys, but especially Marafuji. Um, yeah, he was Marafuji was great right from, from the offset. Um, so I I'd imagine 15 minutes of these two was a good, enjoyable, enthusiastic match. Yeah, next up is our uh, old guy comedy six-man tag team match. Haruka Aigen, Masanobu Fuchi, and Tsuyoshi Kikuchi defeating Mitsuo Momoda, Rushi Kimura, and uh, Satoru Asako. Of course, uh, Asako is a kind of a rookie uh, at this point, and, and Kikuchi's, you know, he's, he's like a peer of Kobashi Kawada and Misawa, but, you know, even, even at... Uh, you know, at this time, he still he, he probably looked like an looking a lot older than he actually is. Uh, Asako was he he had been around since the early nineties, but I think he took a couple of years off, maybe, and then came back and then went away again because he didn't come over to know. Actually, you know what? I think I'm wrong. I think he did a couple of Noah shows, but again, he didn't he didn't stay with it long term. So I I don't know what his his deal was, but he was always a pretty good worker. Like he's in. He's in at least a handful of like the big tag matches that got really highly rated during the nineties. So he was always able to carry his his end of the bargain, even if he wasn't the most charismatic or fiery performer. Kikuchi was awesome, but at this stage, Kikuchi was showing a lot of signs of the punishment that he had put himself through earlier in the decade, catching up to him. And he would kind of rebound in Noah, particularly in uh, 2002 with the feud against the new japan juniors and that was kind of a last hurrah for him but he was he was kind of washed or showing signs of being washed already at this point sadly and and yeah being in there with momoda and eigen was probably the the best place for him on this night singles match uh the you know, another person we talked about that that made kind of made his debut migrating over from from New Japan, but also like fully part of the, the Japanese, you know, uh, diet uh, government is Hiroshi Hase. And he took some, he defeats uh, Masahiro Kakihara uh, from the UWFI in 13 minutes and seven seconds. I'm sure this must have been a really good match. Yeah, I need to check if this is online. I am, I feel like I might have seen it, but I could be confusing it with the Kakihara Kobashi match, which is awesome. But um yeah, I don't know how I didn't think of Hase in terms of other guys they brought in during the late 90s to, to freshen things up. Some people don't like Hase's run in all Japan. As a huge Hiroshi Hase fan of the wrestler Hiroshi Hase, um, uh, I was always I was always a big fan of, of his work. They, they put him in there with the big names and had the big dream matches and they to me they always delivered maybe they were a bit more slow paced than people might have been 
hoping for maybe a little more technical rather than kind of big head drops and everything that people expected from all japan in the 90s but i don't know i thought it was a, a breath of fresh air he, he brought a different challenge to those guys um in the same way that like a gary albright did um so it was, it was a styles clash you know and uh, i thought he did he did very well as i'm sure he'll do again now in his upcoming ghc heavyweight championship run that he's surely gonna have this year oh for sure like divide his time between um you know being a being a member of the diet and 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 you know, running ramp running rampant all over the ghc title scene in, in pressing noah uh next match wolf hawkfield takes on the aforementioned giant kimala uh wolf hawkfield gets the win in 10 minutes and 29 seconds um yeah i don't know i'm sure it was just it was it was a fine little undercard match that that a lot of people needed to needed to have to go to the washroom and or get some concessions it's massive disrespect to uh, the great jungle Jim Steele uh, slash lacrosse slash uh, what was his uh, well, what was the last character he had in um, in all Japan in the mid two thousands he was like oh was mid two thousands was he was he in like voodoo murders or some shit no he was in a, a mudo stable um where he, uh, I I think he was like. Something like Mr. Pro Rest Love or something like that. I'll need to look it up. <laughs> I read I, an interview. I, I read an interview with him recently, um, where he's like a really, uh, really humble guy about his his talents, and he had, like he actually <laughs> he actually compared himself to um, uh, oh god, what's the name of uh, Renegade, where he was saying that like people kind of wanted him to be like renegade but he was like but i wasn't the level of worker that guy was at that state of like, jesus really way to put yourself down so <laughs> saying he, you went the level of worker of renegade uh he was love machine steel that is it yes love machine steel yeah wow i mean no disrespect to to to, to jim steel but like uh, you know at this point as wolf hogfield wasn't really setting the world a fire with his with his work rate um, then we have the tag team. We'll talk about uh, the all Asia tag team title match is made a Honda versus high and Shizaki. So we'll get to that after that. Albright to Kyle Mori and Yoshihiro Takayama. Isn't this, a, isn't this the triangle of power? Um, yeah, this, I, I, the all Japan late 90s stables confused me in terms of time period and when certain things started and when they didn't. And, so I think that that was the three guys that formed the, the triangle of power. The the all Japan stables weren't really. It wasn't like a like they would be a thing, but they weren't really focused on or like it's not like an Lij nowadays where it's like a it lasts really long and b there's so much merchandising and branding and the guys only appear with each other. It wasn't like that in all Japan. Like there'd be these random stables and they might last for a couple of weeks or a couple of months at most they'd have no merch they randomly team with other people it was the same thing in noah as well it was, it was really hard to um to get into uh the the stable like the only time all japan slash noah ever did stables right was super generation army against sarutagon and like that's arguably like the best clash of of groups there's ever been in the history of wrestling so when you've done it that well once you, you probably you, you, i don't know you you don't need to uh do it great ever again and they certainly didn't so uh they defeated the team of bart gun who by the way i mike barton i loved when he when he left wwf and because he knocked legit knocked out dr fc williams baba said you know what you can come over to all japan i think he was so underrated in this run of all Japan. And I think he would have been someone they, that Baba and Misawa later on should have just like, you know, strapped a rocket to in the next, in the coming years, uh, Johnny Ace. And one of my favorite underrated wrestlers, Johnny Smith. Yeah. Me and Johnny Smith, we were a hell of a team. Yeah. As, as good with the ladies as we were in the ring. <laughs> well, the less said about Johnny Ace and, uh, uh, his success with women, especially, uh, in the WWE, uh, the less, the, the better. Um, AWH, do you want a promotion? 
I'm, I'm good where I am. Thanks, thanks, uh, Johnny. Uh, tag team match: Mr. Haramasawa and Yoshinari Ogawa, the Untouchables, take on and defeat Manakea Moss Man, later to be known as Taiokea, and the man they call Vader. Mossman and Vader against who? Ogawa and Misawa. Oh yeah, that's that's good stuff. That's yeah, o- Ogawa always fun, you know. Um, still going today, but uh, yeah, I'd imagine that was Ogawa and Vader is um, an interaction. I- I'd say there was some good cat and mouse stuff there. Oh, uh, for sure, for sure. And our main event for this show was a six man tag team match: Akira Tawe, Masao Inoue, and Toshiaki Kawada taking on and defeating. The burning stable of Junakiyama, Kenta Kobashi, and Kentaro Shiga. I wonder who took the fall in that match, Kentaro Shiga. Yeah, Shiga was good before all his injuries. That's a, a guy who um, had a lot of potential. Uh, a, yeah, he's so quiet. Kind of, he's such a quiet young man as a wrestler, you know? Yeah, he, he, he did his neck in really bad at a, at a very young age. So, like, he was pretty much had to be a gimmick guy then after that. But um, wh- where did you say the uh, our all-Asia tag match was on the card? What position? This was straight in the middle, to be honest. Like, it's okay. it's fourth from the top. So, it's the, uh, yeah, it's, it's like, pretty much in the middle of the card. Which I, yeah. I don't think is a bad place to have, like, a mid-card tag match, a uh, title match. They probably put it on right before intermission, I'd, I'd guess. I'd say they probably went into an intermission after this. Yeah, probably. We, I, I'd have to, if the whole show was available, I'd, I'd probably try to watch most of it and see if there is intermission. But, uh, anyways, let's talk about this match. Jun Izumita and Tame Honda, they are the All Asia Tag Team Champions. They are defending their titles against Hayabusa and Jinsei Shinzaki. Uh, and they beat. Uh, they they won these titles in on October 6, 1998 from the team of Johnny Smith and Wolf Hawkfield. Uh Love Machine, uh, you know, Love Machine Steel and and uh, Johnny Smith there. Uh and uh yeah, they, they I, I don't think they had a very long title reign. I don't I think this might have been their first defense of these belts, uh Alan. Um yeah, all, all the all age tag titles I can't say I'm uh, uh, again footage issues here like knowing the history of these titles it's it they're it's not exactly the most celebrated like the all asia tag titles were were a really fun set of tag titles and there's like a couple of matches which really stand out during the decade that were for those titles but it's like actually like thinking of like the lineage of them and oh this was a super reign where this team had all these matches it didn't really work like that it was you yeah. see the occasion they weren't a priority title but sometimes they they'd have an all age type of a match and give it a a bit of a showcase like we had here and it's, it's the specific matches that stand out rather than the reigns i saw some funny comment where someone was complaining about like you know kendo kashin and and nosawa rangai being the current all Japan all Asia tag champions is like saying Ricky Dozen held those bells. And then I think, I think it was Striga who, you know, came back and said, so, so have, uh, you know, Bull Buchanan and D'Lo Brown. <laughs> so, yeah, there've been some, uh, there've been some interesting holders of those titles, but I still don't think Ken, Ken and No Sawa have any place, uh, no. even on a pro wrestling card uh, in 2023, the damage they've done. Yeah. Uh. I don't want to talk about them. Let's let's talk about the the positives today. Uh, Shinzaki and Hayabusa enter Korkin to applause from the All Japan fans, as well as I'm sure visiting FMW and uh, Michinoku Pro fans. Alan, oh yeah, for sure. It's in Tokyo. You got the hardcores, absolutely. Uh, there, Shinzaki and Hayabusa are wearing matching white gear. Look very very proper, like a like a like a proper tag team. Uh, next are the All Asia Tag Champs, uh, Honda and Izumita. Uh, it's funny how that on one side, like the you know the visiting wrestlers, Hayabi and Shizaki, they look like stars, but they're matching gear. But on the other hand, you have like the native All Japan wrestlers, and uh, they kind of look, you know, they kind of look what what they are, complete mid carters. You know, no, again, no disrespect to t- Tom and Honda. He will Frumpy. become Trumpy is the word you're looking for. Wh? Well, I mean, it's funny. Like he's he's got his gimmick, right? He's he's like an amateur wrestler. He's got that background. And he and he's wearing his singlet, which is fine. But Izumita is like still wearing like plain black trunks, pads, and and short boots, which make you know he still looks like a young boy, which is oddly enough not the look young boys have in all Japan. They actually have like colorful gear, 
but like just boring colorful gear whereas like i guess this is his graduation gear is like okay instead of wearing a you know chartreuse you're now gonna wear just all black yeah i i think baba's um the extent of which baba thought something was looking like a star was hey you're gonna wear blue you're gonna wear green and that was like it like it wasn't like hey you're gonna have tassels or you're gonna have this yeah, I don't know. Like it was, uh, I, I think the FMW guys and guys from different companies in Japan probably had um, more of an emphasis in their training on looking like a star than uh, Baba did uh, in with his all Japan guys. I think it was very much, no, you must be a pro wrestler. I, that was the uh, that was the main thing, and yeah. You better not have those trunks pulled up over your uh, uh, underneath your belly button. You, right. you better you better keep that belly button hidden. Yeah, don't what are you, some kind of bodybuilder or something? Don't want to get too risque in in nineties all Japan with the belly buttons. No. Uh, but I, you know, I think who was going crazy with the uh, the tassels at this time was was one Yoshinobu Kanemaru. I seem to recall him wearing like really like outlandish uh, boots with tassels on them, Alan. Yeah, he, he had long hair as well when he he blonde he hair. Bob, Bob probably looked at him. He was right. Like, oh. Who's this hippie? What's what's this guy doing? It's, how come, who's responsible for this guy, Masao? What's going on here? Uh, it's probably more Akiyama because, like you know, like Akiyama was uh, the uh, the rebellious one during Baba's reign. You know, like he's yeah, under, like it, it was Akiyama, wasn't it? The try to try to wear the trunks that exposed his belly button. I think right. he wanted to wear his shirt untucked. You know, his 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 polo shirt untucked. The the nerve of this man. How dare he in 1999? That's, that's disgraceful. Uh, the match starts. Shizaki and Honda start off walking up in jockeying position. Uh, right away, uh, Tame and Honda is looking to land a headbutt when he gets Shizaki in the corner. Uh, the first time this happens, Shizaki dodges, and the second time, he blocks it with his hands and uh, tries one for one of his uh, upper uppercut thrust uh, shots to the chin. But you know, Honda dodges that and is able to land a headbutt, headbutt which rocks shinzaki uh they lock up again with shinzaki getting control with the wrist and hammer locks on honda but uh another headbutt turns the tide in honda's favor and Izumita gives one of his own from the apron and then he tags in and, and right off the bat the, the the strategy is is to render shinzaki incapable of continuing the match with concussions i think yeah i mean it... <laughs> Honda and Izumita, they don't have a lot going for them skill-wise at this point. Honda's got his amateur wrestling stuff, but Izumita's not got much of anything. And but what both those boys do have is a couple of hard noggins, and uh, they were not afraid to put those things to use uh, as weapons in, in this match. So Izumita continues just going for a series of headbutts, but is rocked by an uppercut thrust from Shizaki, who uh, finally tags Hayabusa in. Uh, Hayabusa comes into the ring via a twisting slingshot body press over the top rope onto Izumita, who had been slammed to the mat just seconds before. Izumita is able to carry Hayabusa over to his corner, where Honda tags in, and they give Hayabusa a double headbutt. Uh, Hayabusa is able to get Honda on the mat, where he locks into head scissors until Izumita breaks the hold for his partner. Izumita comes back in and hits the ropes, knocking Hayabusa down with a shoulder tackle. Hayabusa drops down, but Izumita hits him in the back with a Kukeshi headbutt. Uh, Hayabusa gets hit with another shoulder tackle, and Izumita hits the ropes again, which allows Hayabusa to kip up and then do a crisscross spot with Izumita, which is probably the only time anyone will ever see Izumita do a crisscross uh, spot. In, in a match and he does a leapfrog over the, the bigger man before hitting him with a beautiful standing drop kick. Just a great sequence here with between Hayabusa and, and Junizmita. An, an ambitious one from uh, Hayabusa deciding he was going to try to uh, get J- Junizmita on his bicycle and have a, a, a spot that contained a lot of motion, um, but it, it came off really well. Uh, Shinzaki then tags in and, and uh, giving his partner a much needed break. There are Mon- Mongolian chops from Izumita uh, before Shinzaki capitalizes on opening to hit another one of his signature uppercuts. Uh, another Mongolian chop followed by another attempt, which is blocked by Shinzaki, but Izumita sees the opening to hit another headbutt, which you know lands and busts Shinzaki wide open. Now, I got to say, Alan, it looked like it sh- this looked like a shoot headbutt. 
but there's also a point where I can see where Shinzaki could have done a blade job, like right in front of the camera, because he's like, because he's leaking blood pretty badly, not five seconds after this headbutt. And like, I think there's a point where he's like, you know, he, after the headbutt, he's like this. And then, you know, if he's, he's doing the old carny trick of like, you know, hiding the, uh, the, the razor, the, you know, the cut razor blade inside of his, uh, his tape fingers. That's where he might have done the blade job. Yeah, he, he had spent his time in, in America. He probably knew those tricks. So um, I wouldn't like it. I couldn't say for sure one way or the another. And that's kind of the way I, I, I like it. It's, it's, if it was, if it was a blade job, it was, it was done pretty well and that it still looked like it could have been coming direct from the headbutt. And if it, yeah, it's, you know, I, I, I just thought it was an incredible visual and um, whatever way he arrived at it, like, I'm, I'm one who uh, um, I, I'll enjoy like a, a match where you kind of get some of that uh, hard way blood or whatever that you get in a match like this. But this was like the, the first shot where it's just literally leaking out of his head like a tap. I had forgotten that. And when I was watching it back the other day, I was like, oh my God. Like, I just sat back. I was like, whoa. That way. I was just I, I'm not expecting that level of goriness from uh, from that. So it was, uh, whatever way it happened, it was, um, it certainly achieved or surpassed its goal. I'm going to have to put a disclaimer when I, when I tweet this match out. Alan is preparation for people to watch it and listen to this show. I better say not for the fate of heart because the the blood does flow in this yeah. match. Uh, yeah, th- I mean, I'm like you're saying, great visual. There's like the camera work. The the camera just zooms in on the cut in his head and then like kind of pans down to the blood pooling on the mat. I just, which I thought was just so well done and just so effective to to show like the amount of damage that Izumi's head but had done to Shinzaki here. Yeah, and of course with Shinzaki, and in this case Hayabusa too, uh, wearing all white, as is the normal for uh, Shinzaki. So, it uh, within a couple of minutes, like he was basically wearing a red outfit. Yeah, basically him, him and Hayabusa. Hayabusa had like the uh, these red flames uh, patterns on on his his white uh, trunks, his white pants. But you know, you, af- after a while, it's if, him rolling around on the mat. After Shizaki's blood all over it, like you'd be like hard pressed to think where's the the pattern in and 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 the blood stains begin. It, it, it's really hard to tell sometimes. Uh, but yeah, back to this idea that he was the like, Jinsei Shizaki, of course, was uh, 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 Hakushi, the modern day Kamikaze, which is a weird name to give a guy who's a Shinto priest, in my opinion. But that's Vince McMahon for you. Um, but who who would he have been working with in? in the new generation of the WWF Allen that, that would have taught him or would have like maybe helped him perfect the art of blading. Well, we know Barry Horowitz was the one that was teaching him about American history. And uh, so from the, the wacky skits we saw of them together, um, I reckon the person teaching him blading and old school carny tricks might have been a Freddie Joe Floyd, uh, Tracy Smothers. Uh, I think they would have crossed paths uh, for a little bit there. So, um, but you also had your uh, your Tom Pritchards and people like that on the roster. I I'm sure there were enough old heads that would have been uh, n- knocking around that locker room that would have like, taught him a thing or two. Was Savio Vega as Quang around at that time? I can't remember. Well, they were partners. They were uh, the, the Shoguns. There you go. Were they called that? I I, I don't recall this. I yeah. have to go look for footage of of Shinzaki and and Savio Vega as Quang the Ninja <laughs> team. Yeah, up. yeah, the Shoguns. They had a oh, they had a couple of really fun TV tag matches against like oh, I can't remember. Mike Falcone's gonna kill me for not remembering this, but it was like um, some combo of like your your one two three kid, Bob Holly, Marty Janetti type lower My card God. baby faces that were. Dude, I, you, I now have to like hunt down these matches now. <laughs> this sounds awesome. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is when we finish the show, is I'm going to go look for you know Savio Vega and Jinsei Suzuki, aka Hakushi and Quang, teaming up against like Bob Holly and One Two Three Kid. That sounds like an awesome tag team match. Oh, my yeah. God. 
Uh, but back, back to this match. Shizaki is good to fight still and walks groggily around the ring as Izumi immediately, immediately goes back to headbutting him. <laughs> Poor fella. Uh, Honda tags in and also starts assaulting Shizaki with headbutts uh, as the uh, referee drags Honda away from the prone Shizaki in the corner. Izumita, the bastard that he is, jumps on him with more headbutts. Uh, poor, poor, poor Jinsei Shizaki. Uh, Shizaki is really is really bleeding a gusher here, Alan. He he tries to counter with his own headbutt, which is dumb. And and Honda just says, "Hey, fuck you!" And hey, favor. WH, he is a modern day kamikaze. Remember, he's, yeah, he's also a Shinto priest, which is like I'm pretty sure they're not they're not they're not suicidal. Anyways. Um, <laughs> Uh, Shizaki is thrown to the outside where the crowd in the front are scared of getting his blood on their clothes and I can't blame them. Seriously, like the the, the way the, the, the front row recoils as soon as Shizaki gets anywhere near them at the guardrails is like, it's hilarious. Well, they, they probably had already used up their newspapers in the Eigen Momoda match earlier in the show with the spit spot that those old guys always did where the front row would hold up the newspapers when they do their big spitting uh, spot. Uh, you know about that, do you? Oh yeah, I I've seen it. I yeah, you know. So uh, the the newspapers are probably already used up and disposed of, so they had no protection here against the uh, against the blood. They, they got to do the. They should have just you know like uh, you know been a precursor to what you know big Japan fans do and just like you know bust out the uh, the raincoats and the and the plastic garbage bags that they can wear as ponchos and and stuff like that. <laughs> but oh, those goddamn Brahmin brothers. Who 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 yeah who is to know that uh, Jinsei Shinzaki would would be bleeding this much? But uh, back in the ring, Honda drops Shinzaki right on his fucking neck with a back suplex. So he's getting it all his his whole upper you know head neck area is just getting you know worked over and and uh, and like uh, totally fucked up by by Honda here. Uh, Hibusa makes a save and there's only a two cap. Uh, Shinzaki hits a sunset flip, but Honda immediately drops down with a Yokozuna like bon- Yokozuna style bonsai drop, and then hits more headbutts for the audacity of being caught in, in a sunset flip. Here, Alan. Well, I lost you for the last second there. W H. Sorry, I, I oh, so, up, to bon- up to bonsai drops. He yeah, like you know, like like he he goes from the uh, Yokozuna style bonsai drop into more headbutts as as a punishment for being caught. In, in a move such as the sunset flip from Jinsei Shizaki here. Yeah, it, uh, that's just a classic great wrestling spot is uh especially if there's a bit of a teeter totter before it. Like if it, if the if the heel s- swings his arms around and it's like, oh I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go down, he's gonna get sunset flip on me, and then he just gets his posture back and then just drops all his weight down on the chest. It's it, that is just one of my favorite pro wrestling spots. Uh, Izumita tags in and takes a break from the headbutts to dig his fingers into the cut on Shizaki's head. Nasty, uh, nasty. Shizaki, Izumita, like I said, didn't have didn't have much in the way of skill, but he used different uh, tools here to uh, to uh, you know put himself in a position to actually achieve something. Uh, Shizaki valiantly fights back with his own headbutts again, and and looking kind of dumb for doing so, but. And he and Izumita have a headbutt exchange, which uh, leaves Izumita looking like he's been finger painting on himself with Shinzaki's blood. This was really gross. Yeah, it, w- it was a hell of a visual. I think once again, uh, uh, Shinzaki not learning his lesson. He's persisting with the idea that he can get the better of these headbutt exchanges. But uh, yeah, it's he's starting to get a bit of a momentum going with it. He's starting to you know, inch his way back into things. Uh, Honda comes in and continues to get the heat on Shizaki by applying the STF. There's this great camera shot of Shizaki locked in the move, but his open wound is gushing blood and is visible for those sitting at home. So if you felt left out by not being in Corken Hall, don't worry. You got this great camera shot of just like, you know, like, you know, uh, Honda, like wrapping his, his arm around the, 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 the chin neck of, of Sh- Jinsei Shizaki while, while his open wound is, is pouring out blood wonderful not i was like wow this is more like an fmw match but the wrong guy is bleeding this is like a ufc fight where someone's been sliced open with an elbow there's just blood everywhere 
but you know it does this 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 spot gets a, a really great you know response because the the Jinsei chants start happening Alan like yeah. the, the fans in the in Cork and Hall are like starting to call for Jinsei 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 they really want to see him fight back and it, it's it, it's really great because like he's the he's the invader from another company uh, he's not the all Japan native wrestlers Again, it's hardcores, hardcore fans of Cork and Hall. So there, there's probably a lot of FMW fans, probably a lot of Shinzaki fans. He was a favorite amongst the hardcores of the of the era. Um, but also, I think because these fans are are super kind of like clued in, like they know Honda is a is badass amateur wrestler. So like him applying a, a simple move like an STF, that's a that's a threat to end any match because you know he's and he's going to make it look good too, which which he did of course here. This isn't um, John Cena applying an, an STF. I you know I say that as like a criticism of John Cena's F STFs. I never really understood why people didn't like that. I always thought his STF looked fine, but anyway, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like my my defense of of people who criticize his John Cena's STF, like yeah, it's not as polished as some other people's, but listen, you gotta you get a man with the arms. Of John yeah. Cena wrapping his arm around your fucking neck, like I—that's not gonna that—that that looks that's impressive enough to me yeah. at least. Yeah, it doesn't uh, look like it doesn't look like a day at the day at the spa. No, no. I mean, let's let's you know, John Cena at his at his prime had tree trunks for arms. You know, he could yeah. probably rip off a normal man's head off. Uh, Shizaki is able to drag himself to the ropes to break the hold. Uh, Izumita tags in and goes for a top rope Kokeshi, but meets Shinzaki's feet instead. There's a thrust kick. And he's finally, finally able to tag in Hibis. And, it, and if there's ever, you know, like a, a perfect, like hot tag, Alan, this was it. Yeah, this was a hook uh, on AEW level of hot tag uh, from the other night. Uh, yeah, it, he, he was rocking and rolling when he came in there. Um, and like, the, the the thing with Hayabusa is, whilst he is a very um, performative, emotional, I mean that in a good way, performative, emotional wrestler who can get a lot of sympathy from selling, I think it worked really well with this, holding him back because you had these hardcore fans wanting to see him do his big moves, get in there and change the pace of the match because the fans would have known that guys like Izumita and Honda, they weren't going to know what to do with a Hayabusa and his spectacular, innovative offense. They, they'd they be just completely turned upside down by that kind of offense. They had wrestled a brilliant strategy, keeping that element out of, out of the match and just focusing on just, what we have been describing for the last uh, few minutes uh, and just keeping it basic and keeping Shinzaki grounded and, and going at their own pace and being vicious and making the fans want to see that all change. And that dynamic does completely change when uh, Hayabusa gets into the fold here. Yes. He, 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 after the tag, he does a springboard springboard forearm smash. There's a straight up slap to Honda as he rushes in. A uh, sliding kick sends Honda from the apron into his partner and into the guardrail. Izumita is sent over the rail into the front row by the impact, which allows Hayabusa to hit this beautiful springboard press off the top rope onto the floor into the front row, which is the best spot of the match, just because like the the the. You know, Izumita not only has to be there in, in the correct spot, but he has to be able to catch, uh, you know, Hibis. And Hibis is, is basically, you know, shoving, you know, like the, 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 the momentum and the impact of his, his cross body press here is sending Izumita into the fans in, in that area. Yeah, it was a spectacular spot. It's like, it's the payoff to what the fans have been looking for um, up to this point. It's like you get you get the heels for lack of a better term you get them all discombobulated they don't know what way they're going hayabusa's turning them inside out and then the flurry peaks with this huge maneuver to the to the floor it's it's a it's a thing of beauty it's great pro wrestling psychology you withhold something from the fans that they clearly want 
until the point where you're going to get the biggest reaction from giving it to them. And then when you give it to them, you give them something this level of spectacular, like all they could have wanted for the last 20 minutes was to see something like this. And then they get it and they react accordingly. Izumita is thrown back into the ring and, and Hayabusa follows up with a slingshot leg drop, a spinning high kick, fisherman buster. H- Honda breaks up the pin to a chorus of boos from the fans. There's a series of form- forearms to Izumita. Hayabusa hits the ropes, but is met with a near decapitating lariat from Izumita. Uh, Honda comes in and he knocks Hayabusa halfway across the ring with his own lariat. Uh, Hayabusa is front is, is shot front first into the turnbuckles, uh, Bret Hart style, and Honda knocks him in the back of the head with another lariat. Uh, from here, Honda goes for a power bomb, but Hayabusa reverses it with a Frankensteiner and tags in Shinzaki. And and again, another like another you know like they, they're getting the heat on Hayabusa now. Shinzaki's had a bit of time to recover. He tags in. There's a springboard chop to the top of the head and reverse kick to knock Izumita off the apron. And now I gotta say, maybe maybe Hayabusa and and Shizaki are like the precursors to maybe like the young bucks doing all these like springboard you know offensive maneuvers in their tag matches. Yeah, you didn't see a lot of this kind of thing in in 1999. A uh, a famously uh, low energy era of wrestling, low creativity year for wrestling, and uh, um, a lot of walk and brawls in 1999. And uh, yeah, these these two guys were big time innovators. And like even something like the the springboard chop to the head like it's just a chop to the head it's the safest simplest move in the world but like i know it just looked i always thought that looked cool when shinzaki would do it uh hayabusa comes in and they hit a double face drop on honda hayabusa hits a springboard swanton from one side of the ring uh shinzaki hits a springboard knee drop from the other side hayabusa with a line salt shinzaki i, I love that combo that was oh yeah awesome. Shizaki with his trademark praying flying shoulder tackle, uh, a pin attempt, but only a two count here. And by the way, the the mat is completely get, covered in blood at this point. It's just such. It's just, thinking about like, oh my god, they're really gonna have to like scrub this thing clean before for after the intermission. Maybe that's maybe it was designed to be like this before the intermission because that's maybe when they had to go in and just like scrub it down, Alan, and clean it off. Yeah, you know, there's mounting evidence for. A, a blade job here or at the very least um we'll just headbutt you until you bleed because between the ways the cameras picked up the blood both guys wearing all white um the positioning of the match on the card it 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 certainly seems like they were it was it didn't catch anyone uh, by surprise that there was blood in this match uh, Honda blocks a power bomb with a backdrop and hits his own Kokeshi headbutt. Uh, Izumita comes in and hits a top rope diving headbutt, but Hayabusa breaks up the pin attempt. More headbutts with a running jump front kick to break up the monotony until Shinzaki reverses the Irish whip and hits an enziguri. Hayabusa tags in and hits a, rever- a springboard reverse spin kick. Hayabusa catches Izumita on the top rope and hits a belly to belly suplex from there, which is which is kind of funny. Like you would think it'd be maybe like Honda hitting the belly to belly suplex from the top rope, but no, it's it's Hayabusa, you know, and he throws the big man over over his own head from the from the top rope. Great great move from him. Uh, there's a Jimmer suplex and only a two count on Izumita. Uh, just an, again another great sequence here from like the Shizaki and and uh, and uh, Hayabusa, but also like you know like. It's a really back and forth match at this point. Yeah, it's. Uh, I I love when you get a tag match like this, where again, go back to the strategy. One team have this very clear strategy that they stick to, and it's working really well, and for a long period, and then it goes out the window, and they lose control of the match. But then gradually they adjust to what the match is now, and they give themselves another chance. You know, it's um. It's a story you see told in all sports, um, like any any sport that I can think of. I, I, I've seen matches or games where um, momentum has switched in such a way where one team just had or one player just had things under control for a long period and then they lose control and things go a bit awry, but then they kind of get themselves back into it. And then it's kind of all to play for it's 50, 50. 
From here, Shinzaki comes in and drop kicks Honda off the apron. Hayabusa hits the Firebird Splash, but Honda breaks up that pin, that bastard. Honda then lands, uh, then lands machine gun headbutts on Hayabusa. Uh, he tags in and goes for a German suplex, but his back is to Shinzaki, who hits him with a beautiful springboard forearm to the back of the head. And Hayabusa hits him with a high kick to the head. There's a tag. Shinzaki hits the springboard missile drop kick and then goes for his straight jacket chokehold. Izumita tries to stop Shinzaki while he's covering Honda, but Shinzaki catches his foot and does his unique version of the uh, Dragon Screw leg whip. And and I don't know, Alan, can you describe like how if people who haven't seen this match, I'm just listening to this first. His his version of this Dragon Screw leg whip is is so cool. Can you describe name, it? There's a name for it, and I don't know if it's a name specifically given by Shinzaki, but um, in different wrestling video games, I remember this move having its own its own name but yeah it is a, it's a totally different style of of dragon screw where it almost looks like the ankle gets um more of a, a punishment than a, a traditional dragon screw um yeah really really cool um just the it looks it looks like it would just destroy every part of your leg if you were taking this move i mean the the the, the interesting thing about how Shizaki does it as opposed to like say Tatsumi Futami or you know Keishimura or Hiroshi Tanahashi is like those guys will like use one like hold one use one arm to hold the leg and then use their other to like just jam their forearm into the leg into like yeah, the, they, the they joint from, from the inside kind yeah. of yeah whereas Shizaki holds both a foot with both his arms he twists and his opponent twists with them sending them like 360 over the ring and like you got to think it's, it's it's like i always wonder how the mechanics of that because like you, your opponent has to go along with you and if your opponent is, doesn't look that agile which you know neither of these guys you know honda or Izumita, look that agile that they're it must be a lot of his own strength as well like and his own momentum like carrying these guys over yeah i i would think it's one of those things where wrestlers kind of show each other how to take a move to um, make it look the way it's intended. And and most of the time things play out like that. But then obviously there's lots of famous examples like styles clash with guys not tucking their head and stuff like that, where guys don't take a move the way it's supposed to. And you could totally see like this one, if the person wasn't the person taking the move, wasn't like athletically coordinated or whatever. And and they'd get confused in the moment and, and, kind of start turning the wrong way and and once you do that it's all going to go awry but no it was taken perfectly here and i've never seen this move kind of go awry it always seems to be uh, maybe that speaks to shinsaki maybe he's a good communicator in terms of teaching people what they need to do to take this bump uh shinsaki holds up honda and hayabusa hits him with a springboard face crusher and then he runs across the ring to deliver a plancha onto izumita who is on the floor just just amazing athleticism. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Shinzaki tries for a dragon screw on Honda, who blocks with headbutts and goes for a German. But Hayabusa hits him with a springboard chop to the head, and Shinzaki follows up with his beautiful uh, Pele kick style uh, kind of enziguri here, which I, I love when he does. This is one of his signature moves that I just absolutely love, Alan. Yeah, it's uh, I've always loved that move. AJ Styles, anyone who, who does a, a, a move like that, it's just a really, uh, really spectacular looking move. Uh, Izumita comes in with another headbutt, which gives Honda the opening he needs to hit a delayed high angle German suplex for the one, two. Oh, no, there's a kick out. There's another headbutt exchange, including one from Izumita to Shinzaki while he's on the apron. And then Honda hits another German, but Hayabusa saves his partner in the nick of time. Izumita takes Hayabusa to the outside, which al- allows Honda to hit another delayed high angle German suplex and finally get the one, two, three. Uh, I I didn't I I forgot. Wait, where, where's the uh, the time of this match? Uh, in twenty three minutes. Twenty four minutes. Yeah, it's just under twenty four minutes. Um, it didn't feel like twenty four minutes, Alan. Like you know, you, like I, I felt it felt like maybe a a. a uh, sub 20 minute match that's what the pacing of this especially these the, the back half of this 
excuse me, just made it feel like uh, an utter like uh, sprint for me. Yeah, it, it flies by. It's really enjoyable. Yeah, it's one of those matches so easy to lose yourself in. Um, you're not gonna be, you're not you're not gonna be looking on your phone or or you know the, just getting distracted. If you if you start paying attention to this match and let it grab you your attention, it will. And yeah, I, I, I love wrestling like that. So um, yeah, it ruled. Uh, awesome finish. Um, Honda, one of the best executors of a German suplex ever in wrestling. His Germans are fantastic. Um, the German he gave Kobashi for a near fall under GHC heavyweight title matches. It's a classic Noah spot to me. Um, and uh, yeah, he delivered a he delivered quite a choice uh, German here to to win the All Asia Gold and it was you know taken really well. And the whole the whole scene of um, of the the final last save getting in there before um Izumita did his part I I will say I think there was an opportunity for Izumita to do something I don't know maybe a bit more spectacular to clear um it was Hayabusa wasn't it uh, made the save to clear Hayabusa out of the ring like maybe like hit some kind of a lariat or something or maybe pay off all the rest of the match and do a headbutt or, or something but he just kind of Bowled him to the outside in non spectacular fashion, which probably was in keeping with Izumita as a character and with the story of the match in many ways. But uh, I think that it, that element of the finish could have maybe popped just a little bit more. But Honda and Shinzaki, in terms of the actual move for the pin, made it look great. Yeah, I, I, I thought this is a, a fantastic All Asia tag team title match. I thought what made it great was the drama of the cut on Shizaki said and, and the blood, but and, and just the kind of continual assault from the head, but also, you know, like you didn't know who, you know, it could have gone either way. It's for the all Asia tag titles. Like, you know, they're, they're titles that, that Bobo does not have a problem putting on other people, like people that you would not think should hold these titles or would win these titles. So this, this match could have gone either way. Like is Amita and Honda aren't necessarily protected guys in all Japan. So, I think a lot of the drama for me, like I didn't know the outcome of this match before I watched it, which is great. I always love when that happens, uh, when I when, when I'm actually able to do that for for this particular show because I do know the outcomes of most of these matches. Um, but yeah, I just thought, just like if I was in Corican for this live, this this kind of a match, then I would probably be like, you know, rating it really high on my like year end list or something like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a special match, and it's one that, like, yeah, as you said, if you're there live for, you're gonna, it's gonna really stick out in in your memory because it's just it's very it's very different. It's guys you wouldn't be used to or expecting to have. Like, it would be such a bonus if you went to this card and you're looking at your main event with your Kobashi and your Akiyama guys at that. And you you see Vader on there and um, going against Misawa and a tag and. And you've got all these kind of marquee things and that you are expecting to be very, very good. And then it's like, you see this match, it's like, oh, okay, that's kind of a weird match for the All-Asia, but it'd be cool to see Hayabusa and Shinzaki. And then the match unfolds as it does here. Like I did a show um, a couple months ago um, on, on Pro Press Paradise about miracle matches and um, kind of matches that you wouldn't expect to be just something clicks and they just really de deliver more than they should on paper. And this is a really great example of a, a miracle match in terms of what I think of that being. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, uh, just a couple of notes as we close out, uh, these two teams would rematch about a month later on February 13th, back at Corken Hall where Haibusa and Shizaki would win the all asia tag team titles uh haibusa and jinsei shizaki would successfully defend them once in, in fmw defeating the team of masato tanaka and tetsuhiro kuroda remember him alan tetsuhiro kuroda with the with the towel and the the uh team uh, no respect dance how can anyone forget the team no respect dance so have you ever seen kojima joining in on the team no respect dance i i have i can't remember exactly what the context of it was, but I do have this vivid image in my brain right now. He was, he was um, into he, it. He, he was, he, a... yeah, oh yeah. He, Kojima threw himself double feet right into that one. Well, see, 
is he invading? No, was like what was who's his name? Kanemaru was uh, is he invading all Japan? When, no, when was it? it was like on an Apache Pro show or something. That was I think he teamed with um, Makabe. No, he teamed with those guys against like great, a great bash heel team. I think. Oh, okay, team. okay, all right. Uh, yeah, so that 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 FMW match happened on March nineteenth, and Hibis and Jinsei Shizaki would lose the All Asia Tag Team Title to the team of No Fear, who are, of course Takao Mori and Yoshihira Yoshihiro Takayama on June fourth. So uh, I think all these matches would probably be worth watching. I have seen the rematch. I, I would say this match, well, that match is fun to watch as well. This one has a little bit more drama with like you know the blood and stuff like that, but. Uh, yeah, a, a great little run for for like from you know co- continuing from the the nice run in the real real world tag league from 1997 for Hayabusa and uh, Jinsei Sasaki. I'm sure I will get to reviewing the match that they have with Kawada and Tawe at some point on the show, and uh, look forward to do that. Maybe maybe with you, Alan. Maybe that'll be our our next match to do sometime in the future. Oh, sorry. I thought I was on mute and I went to unmute myself and realized I wasn't. Um, the, uh, uh, th- this being the uh, Kawada and um, Tawei 97 match, is it? Yeah. Maybe maybe we'll do that in the future one of these days. For sure. For sure. Or, or something else that you might be like, I want to talk about this one, though. And that, that's well, What else did I have on the list I, g- I gave you, WH, of, of random kind of matches that I thought would be interesting? Go back and look at our, our DMs here. Uh, I can do that really quickly. I'm just going to scroll up. Uh, Kobashi versus Honda, from like you, which you were referencing. Oh yeah, Nora. Yeah. We could do that one. That that fits in with the theme of the show. Uh, Kawada, Tawe, and Honda. You you really have a, we're on a Honda kick or something versus Masawa, <laughs> Kobashi, and uh, and Asako from '95. Yeah, I mean, Asako in a. I think that was a five star observer match, which is right, why yeah. I picked it out because I I it's. Uh, Probably the only five star match to include Timon Honda and Satoru Osako. Also, Canem Express versus Joe Malenko and Kenta Kobashi for the All Asia Tag Titles from '89. Love that match. So yeah, you know what? We can we can pull from this list. You you know what? You 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 uh, you you got to do you you'll I'll let you do the honors next time when I give you the call. I say, hey, Alan, do you want to come back on? And you know, if you think of something else, that's awesome as well. But any of these matches sound like they would be fun to. Uh, watch and review with you. Who knows, WH? I might find some giant Kima, Kima, Kimala too. Of course, you must emphasize the I instead of the A in Kimala. Right. Some giant Kimala two match um, that uh, just knocks my socks off that I demand we we do instead. Maybe you can. It's like giant Kimala two and Izumita versus I don't know uh, George Hines and Jim Steele. Hey George okay. Hines, plug for my 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 pal Chris Hero, his his shoot interview series on High Spots. Really, like listeners to this show in particular would very much enjoy the George Hines interview with Hero. Huge amounts of knowledge and and stuff into our our experience, I should say, of um, being on tour with All Japan in the nineties and being around all these guys. Like it's it's fascinating because George Hines did hundreds of tours for all japan in the 90s and the 2000s so um yeah really really interesting stuff in in that oh yeah definitely worth checking out george hines for people who don't know didn't didn't go to noah he stayed in all japan and and they they gave him a strong push like during like the the return of tenru era so definitely like that would be if you're interested in that history definitely go check out uh the podcast Kirsty Hero does with George Hines for sure but uh let's let's plug stuff for for you Alan where can people find more of Alan Farrell I would say uh Alan Farrell's Progress Paradise is the best place to go and of course that's uh over at PW Torch VIP uh subscribe to uh P- PW Torch VIP get yourself a, a month's membership try it out there's often deals up there to get it on the cheap uh, um, for a month as a trial. And I, I figure if you, if you try it out, you probably won't turn back because there's so it's, I always push like I, I'll let the other people like on the torch at Wade and everyone like that. They'll probably push like the modern talk, talking to V and AW because that's what most people are interested in. Let's be honest. But me being a little off the beaten path, I, uh, 
I will always use my plugs for Torch VIP to tell people, go listen to the audio archives of like Wade Keller's radio show from 1993, where you'd get Paul Heyman coming in and politicking, not just politicking his spot in the business, but this man was doing politicking for his lawsuits that he was embroiled in in w with wcw like this like crazy stuff so you get paul Heyman calling in one week and eddie gilbert calling in the next and all this kind of just the, the the machinations of the of the wrestling business and the in the, the early 90s are just fascinating to me and and you really get to hear all of that and how it was reacted to in the time by young wade with his radio show the guests that would come on terry funk would be a regular sean waltman would be a regular and also the, the fans would call in you'd get like a weekly uh, a weekly caller asking hey uh, wait uh, like Who's who's playing Doink the Clown? Like you'd get that caller every single week, or you'd get like whatever happened to uh, Bruiser Brody? And he's like, oh, he's dead. <laughs> so yeah, fascinating to listen to all the, of course, the Torch newsletter archives going back to the late eighties are up there. There's so much great historical content. It's a it's a treasure trove. Like you will find so much interesting things. Uh, Chris Savisa was the guy who covered Japanese wrestling for the torch back in the day. Um, and he, he, reading his writings and his thoughts on, on things at that time are, are super interesting. So um, yeah, uh, get, get a VIP membership to the torch. That's my plug. Um, and uh, I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. He's also, if you want to find him on, on Twitter, he is at Alan Farrell on Twitter. I'm at WH Park 9. And I got to say, Alan, I, I don't know anyone who whose like, knowledge of wrestling is matched by their knowledge of wrestling audio as much as you. So I always like, I feel I always learn something when, when talking with you. And, and uh, thank, you for, thank you for coming on to the show. I, I love talking with you again. And, and I, I hope we can do it again uh, sooner rather than later. And, and we'll we'll talk we'll have a great banter as well i always like doing that with you as well and yeah check alan out over at the pro wrestling torch along with like a lot of other people that have uh, appeared on like in particular rich fan our good friend rich fan has been on the show and, and and done mcu later of course here at post wrestling but so many great personalities and 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 uh uh, writers and, and, and reporters analysts over at the torch you know like i i say if you want the best bang for your buck for for wrestling content related content then it's either it's post wrestling and the torch are probably your most uh trusted sources and and uh most i think the highest quality in my humble opinion alan well, i love what the guys do over at uh, post wrestling yourself including wh it's uh, yeah, it's it's great stuff. I have all the respect in the world for John Away and what they've achieved there. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's it, it's a real uh, in a wrestling media climate, which can be kind of like banging your head against the wall sometimes when you see some of the stuff that's out there. And um, John Away are a shining light, and post wrestling is a shining light am amongst that for sure. So, um, yeah, always, always encourage. Uh, not that I have to tell anyone who's listened to this show, but always encourage people to check out post wrestling uh, uh, guys that are doing things right. And uh, next month we will have. I have already secured the services of one John Cena to be coming on to uh this show and we'll be talking about i'm not going to tell you what we're talking about but you'll have to keep an eye on social media as well as how's this uh, stf looking these days who john Cena? i i i don't think john Cena. uh you know note to slander good old john Cena, but uh i don't think he could be able to put on stf i i, I think the mechanics of it might confuse him no offense john if you're listening yeah, i know he's listening he listens to every show i do but um but we'll have John on next week and next month, sorry. And then he'll be, uh, he'll be, he picked a match. We'll talk about what it is then. But uh, on behalf of Alan, thank you for everyone listening and watching on YouTube. Thank you. You know, leave, leave a like, subscribe to the Post Wrestling YouTube channel, uh, subscribe to, you know, the, the Post Wrestling Cafe, the Patreon. Uh, you can find it all at the website postwrestling.com. And until next time, thank you for, for listening. And until then, I will say goodbye.